Zoom in on it. Okay. Now, stop. Okay, 425. Today, rational expressions. And I'm not entirely sure what Mr. Singer did with you guys with rational expressions last year. So this is a review, but if you've never seen them before, I may need to slow down. It's part of why the homework isn't up yet tonight. Did you guys see rational expressions last year? Have you seen them before? I don't know what they are. Uh, really familiar. Sounds familiar. Sounds really, okay. really familiar. Rational expression is a basically a fraction made up of polynomials. It's a case where f of x equals one polynomial function over another polynomial function where these two are both polynomials. You can create other fractions like this that aren't polynomials, but the rules that I'm about to tell you won't work unless you're certain that the top and the bottom are both polynomials. So if you're not sure of that definition, double check your notes on that before you go on with this. Why wouldn't they be a poly why wouldn't they be a polynomial? Um, excellent question. A negative exponent in any case, a fractional exponent or decimal exponent anywhere in there. Um, those are the biggies. Imaginary those are the biggies. Number. An imaginary number would definitely wreck this. Yeah, the exponents all have to be integers. They all have to be zero or greater. Um, and you can't have any sine, cosine, tangent, or logarithm in there anywhere. Huzzah. Huzzah, yes. Um, some of the rules I'm giving you will work, even if those things aren't met, others won't. Now, a um, couple of examples of this. First off, you've already dealt with one simplest example. f of x equals 1 over x is a rational expression. 1 is a polynomial. It's a monomial with only a constant term, but it counts. No, it's not. It's a fraction. Just the one part. Okay. All right, just the just the numerator. It's a fraction. The denominator <laughs> stuff is a monomial with just a linear term. Um, one x. So this it. is the simplest possible example of a rational expression. Um, as we talked about when we did rotated conics, this has a particular look. It uses the y and x axes both as asymptotes. It passes through one one. Down here, that's all in quadrant one. Down here in quadrant three, it uses the x and y axis as asymptotes and passes through negative one, negative one. This has certain end behavior we can predict. And I need to give you some new notation. Okay. If I, I'm going to use notation slightly differently from the books, I'm skipping ahead to the notation you'll use next year in calculus. If I want to talk about the limit as x approaches infinity of f of x, the limit of where x is headed, we don't care if it gets there, what is y doing as x heads there? Your book will arrange this slightly differently. They'll say as x heads towards something, y heads towards blank. This is a way to combine it all into one statement. What is y getting close to, as apparently, as x gets very, uh, gets very large? Zero. Zero. As x goes as far as you can imagine to the left, what is y getting close to? Also zero. Also zero. From below instead of from above, but true. All right, now we're going to talk about something new. Are you ready? Same function, 1 over x. The limit as x approaches 0 is interesting on this case. Because 0 is where we have a vertical asymptote, as we talked about before on tangents and on this function. It keeps getting closer to the y-axis without ever reaching it. But it won't ever reach 0. Oh. Will it? Take the calculus course. <laughs> Um, you'll, we'll, they'll talk all about that. that now, I'm putting a plus sign next to the zero, and what this means is the limit as x approaches zero of f of x, if I put the plus sign here, it means from the right. If I put a zero there, and then I'm asking what is the limit as x approaches zero from the right, what is y doing? 
On the right's from this side. It's infinite. Ramsey's got it. As x gets closer and closer to zero from this side, y gets closer and closer to infinity. As we approach zero from the left, we use a minus sign. It's negative. Ramsey's got it again. As we approach zero from the left, the function keeps going down as far as we can imagine. Here's a quick preview. Although well, actually, it's less of a preview. It will be relevant soon, very soon. Um, Didn't you say though that mathematically it keeps on getting to there, but if you take, it will hit it. Like if you say, like if I take plus or minus, it's going to be one, then it'll be uh, half, then it'll be whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah. Well, that's the beauty of limits, which I, I don't have time to get into as much as I'd like to today. The beauty of limits is the question that a limit asks is, where is it headed? A separate question is whether it ever gets there. I want to know that. <laughs> <laughs> I know, it's a, it's a great question. Um, now, if you have a limit that has one value when you approach from the right and another value from when you approach to the left, when you talk about the actual limit, there's three conditions for the existence of limits. We're not only going to talk about one of them today. But if a limit equals one thing from the right and another thing from the left, now is the time when it is appropriate to quote that mathematical genius Lindsay Lohan and the say, limit. The, the limit, limit does not exist. exist. The limit does not exist. So this is where it's appropriate to write does not exist because if No, 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 no. You have to write the whole thing. Yeah, the whole thing, please. <laughs> really? Yeah. And then put it in quote, yeah. Yeah, you have to quote her in the movie, the producer. The limit does, the rest you can look up on IMDb. The limit does not exist. <laughs> LL. <laughs> That's her graffiti tag. Um, I know, because we hang out. Um, <laughs> so if the limit is one thing from the right and something else from the left, the actual limit will not exist. It's said to not exist. It's one of the definitions. Um, it's a little bit off of what you need to know for tonight's homework. Yes. Yes, we're not doing it. You watched the movie, dude. That's right. How do you know that it doesn't exist? She said it. Because she erased the guy's This is my observation, but Kath, if you look at this graph, as we approach from the right, y is heading to positive infinity. As we approach from the left, y is heading to negative infinity. Anytime a limit equals one thing from the right and a different thing from the left, the limit is said not to exist when you take away the left and right marks. Okay. So if you don't get the same answer here and here, you don't get that answer, then it doesn't exist. Just go over here. We get to say the limit doesn't exist. I know. <laughs> That's right. Okay, now. Thank you, Lindsay. Um, Thank you so much. Let's get now for uh, other um, rational expressions get a little more complicated. First, we're going to go back to domain now. I left off the last test because I knew we'd get to it today. Domain of a rational expression. Now, there's a couple of the only problems with domain we talked about last time were zeros in the denominator, which we'll talk about more. The other one, square root functions, had domain issues. We're not going near those because square root functions are not polynomials. So the only zeros we're going to worry about, well, there's two now. Zeros in denominator create a vertical asymptote. That's one type. The other type is a big unless you have 0 over 0. 0 over 0 is an interesting, interesting problem. Um, talk a little bit about that. The really? first example. Yeah. Is it that interesting? I love it. It really is. <laughs> Actually. Everything is <laughs> like that. Um, true, but this one in particular. It's one of my favorites. Um, okay, first quick example. I feel like you say that every time. Yeah. <laughs> How does she deal with it? F of x equals <laughs> 1 over x minus 8. Um, there's two ways to look at this. The slightly simpler way, slightly simpler way is to ask the question, 
when is the denominator zero? When x equals eight. Is that eight? Yes. Right. So x can't equal eight. Didn't we already go over this? Yes. We did. But now we're going to talk about how it's a polynomial. It affects in a graph though. Poop. Okay. A little bit. But um we did go, yeah, we did go over domain before. Um x can't equal eight. That takes care of the domain restriction. You can write it a couple other ways, but I'm just going to stick with this one for now. Um, another example. f of x equals 1 over, let's see if I can do this, x squared plus 7x, watch me mess this up, minus 8. Actually, I take it back. I want to make it minus 7x plus 8. Nope, I lied to you again. <laughs> this is just for those of you who take notes in pen, just to annoy you. Yeah, thank you. Um, all right. Okay. Did I come up with a quadratic that is factorable? Ah, yes. stupid. Okay. What, does, what are the two factors that this breaks down to? X minus 4, X Oh, crap. So, no. No. Eight and one. Yeah. Eight and yeah. one, because there's a sign difference. Minus one. Uh, that would be plus. Plus, eight. plus one, minus so eight, actually, because, Nick, we have the negative 7x, so the larger number has to be the negative. Yeah. Okay? So in this case, x simply can't equal uh, negative one, and x can't equal eight, and we're good, correct? Now, when we get to graphing these tomorrow, these will be vertical asymptotes. And we'll talk about what to do with them. So, why are you redoing all this? Well, I'm going to add to it now. That was a review of a recent review. Now we're going to add something to it. All you need is love. It's true. Um, okay, now what? What do I do with this one? Nothing. Well, you only look at the bottom. Here, I'm seeing. Well, you got to be careful of one thing. Here's a new thing. What does this bottom factor down to? Uh, same, the same thing. Yeah. X plus one, X, X minus, minus eight. eight. Can you zoom in on this thing? No, but it's a pretty good lens. And it's high depth. It's high depth? Yeah, so you ought to be able to see it online. You can do it full screen. Okay. No. What can I do now? Come on, really? Figure out the same answer as <laughs> What can it, I have an x minus 8 on the top. Is oh, that yeah, a hint? factor. Really, I put the parentheses in and then you can see it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's kind of embarrassing that you yes, So it's just 1 over x plus 1. With one exception. It's 1 over x plus 1, except this is not equal to this everywhere. This restriction still applies. See, what happens is this gives me a domain restriction of x can't equal negative 1, right? Yeah. But because we can, well, we can't use this equal sign to say it's equal to this one unless we deal with this um, my, x minus 8 over x minus 8. Because if x is equal to 8, you will get 0 over 0. So even though there's no reason here, to care about the 8, because it came from this, because we're calling it equal to the original function, x still can't equal positive 8 as well. Wait, I thought it can. I thought it's unless you have 0 over 0, which in that case it's okay. No, unless you have 0, oh, 0 over 0 is, I'm sorry, unless was a poor choice of word there. That's the second case where you have a problem. Okay. So uh, 0 is in the denominator. And if you have 0 over 0, you have a problem. Then this one I zero, want to graph. 0 in the denominator always. Is, um, yeah, but this is a different problem. This doesn't work out the same way. Here, I'll do a quick graph of this one. Um, and I'll show you what happens. Well, first, I want to talk about why 0 over 0 is a problem. Because we'll get back to this first. On the first thing we do calculus. Um, Are we actually doing calculus in this class? I, I, I mean, I, if it kills us all, we're getting through the derivative. Damn it. Okay. Why did it kill us all? <laughs> Is 0 over 5 
problematic? No. Now, if we write this as a multiplication problem, and I have blank times 5 equals 0, correct? Mm hmm And what times 5 gets you 0? Zero. Zero. 0. So 0 on top, if 0 is only on top, is never a problem. Okay? Is 5 over 0 equals blank a problem? B, senor. Yes. Because I rewrite this as blank times 0 equals 5, and what times... It's undefined, right? Yeah, it's undefined. It's not a darn thing. We cannot define anything that we can multiply by 0 and get 5, so we say it's undefined. We can't reverse the operation. 0 over 0 gets you a different problem. 0 over 0 equals blank can be rewritten as blank times 0 equals 0. Zero. Anything. Anything. Which is different from infinity, actually, Parker. It's a good thought, right direction, but... Yeah, anything is one word. Anything. So if 0 over 0, I get to pick it? No, anything. I know it's one word, but I thought it looked better. I'm going for aesthetics <laughs> over grammar. <laughs> Booth would not approve. No, he would not. Um, so anything times zero equals zero, that makes this fraction very problematic. We don't want fractions where we get to pick the value. What's wrong with that? It would make the natural processes that we use these fractions to analyze very troublesome. The downfall of modern society? Yes, everything would fall apart. So this is actually called, this one we call undefined. And zero over zero is the first indeterminate form and by first you will learn when are we on the others? Uh, whenever you get to what's called L'Hopital's rule in AP Calculus which is uh, kind of a discrete subject it can be taught several different times in the course how many how much longer um, I'm not sure I think I just want to get through this one graph any questions on this actually would like to erase this and leave that graph on that board Huh? Is it about the camera or your arms? No, it's just, I'm nose. getting bored. Okay, all right. Okay. Uh, Mrs. Punjab. Oh, you good? Ramsey's volunteering. Okay. Ramsey Punjab. Thank you. Okay. Um, I will now erase this part. You guys good on the difference between zero on the top, zero on the bottom, and an indeterminate form? You guys good on that? Okay. Now. I'm going to graph f of x equals x minus 8 over x squared minus 7x minus 8. Huh? Oh. This polynomial up here. That. Now, it is almost equal to this one here, 1 over x plus 1. So I can go ahead and graph this one. I just have to keep in mind that there was a 0 over 0 in there. Here's how I'm going to treat it. The parent function... is 1 over x, and then the actual function 1 over x plus 1, the only difference between the two is there's a plus 1 snuggled up with the x under the fraction bar. So what do you do with the number that is closest to the x inside the same operation? Is this my a, b, k, or h? K. K, it's my counterintuitive shift. I'm graphing y equals this. This is my counterintuitive shift left to right. Counter with a k. Counter with a k. Which means all I have to do is take 1 over x and move everything over 1 to the left. So instead of the y-axis as an asymptote, I have uh, the line y equals, I'm sorry, x equals x equals negative 1. Instead of passing through 1, 1, it'll pass through 0, 1. It will also pass through negative 2, negative 1. And it will mostly look something like this, but don't draw it yet. There's a surprise coming up. A good surprise or a bad surprise? I don't know. Because this came from f of x equals 
x minus 8 over, right, in factored form, x plus 1, x minus 8. At the place where we have a 0 over a 0, this function cannot exist. But it doesn't behave as if there's an asymptote there. It just doesn't exist there. So above the 8 on the x-axis, we draw a hole. This is what we will later call a buttonhole discontinuity. Oh. Must you? Really? <laughs> really? Who was there? Saying nothing. Okay, it's a buttonhole discontinuity. So this is how you would have to graph this particular situation. Um, any questions on this? So for purposes of domain, no psychedelic effects, please. That, um, that was no, see? It was okay, no. uh, okay Got thank it? you for, for nodding there. Um, it was shaking my head, actually. So on this one, this x plus 1 created a vertical asymptote. The x minus 8 over x minus 8 created a buttonhole discontinuity. <laughs> Both of these are breaks in the domain. You have to account for both of them when talking about your domain restrictions. Only one of them creates a vertical asymptote. Uh, Parker. Like a buttonhole of the continuity. It's not, it's not there, though. It's just, you know, it's, it doesn't do anything. It doesn't stop it. It doesn't. It, no, doesn't. it actually does stop it. It's actually a point where the function absolutely doesn't exist. Wait, but you just proved that we could plug in anything to be where that spot is, right? Yeah, but the problem with that is it can't behave like an asymptote. It's not like an asymptote where the function doesn't exist, but as you get closer to that point where it doesn't exist, the behavior of the function radically changes. It starts going up to infinity or down to negative infinity. The, actually, as close as you can imagine getting to 8, this behaves exactly like this simpler function. Until you get to exactly 8? So you get to exactly 8. It's 7.9999999 with almost as many 9s as you can imagine it behaves exactly like 1 over x plus 1. But the moment you get to 8, boom, non-existence. So we put that in there because it doesn't change the behavior anywhere except exactly at 8. But I thought it does exist, we're just not sure what goes into it. Um, Shouldn't everything exist? Shouldn't it be a yeah, huge line, line, vertical line? Well, then it wouldn't be a function. Who cares? But the short answer is, for whatever reason, mathematicians don't do it that way. I'm uh, I don't have a short number theory, or even a long, good number theory answer for you on that one. He does your calculator does it this way, I'll tell you that, which is not like a proof that it should. But if you actually go to your calculator and trace this, x equals 8, it, your calculator will actually say y equals... Error. won't even have an error. It'll just have a blank. It'll actually just be blank there. Um... For the type of physical phenomenon you're trying to graph with this, you can't really choose them. Even though it can be anything, um, you actually don't get to pick, and there doesn't seem to be a way to pick. When we get to our first example of a derivative, uh, we'll be talking about speed. Okay. Um, it would be really nice if right before you hit the tree with your car, you could magically pick any speed at which you would like to hit it. <laughs> yeah, that would really be nice if you could do that, but you can't. So and once you start applying this to real-world situations, the short answer is you don't get to pick, and the longer answer is why it's a buttonhole instead of that vertical line. Just requires a little more number, definitely more number theory than I'm prepared to talk about, and a lot, possibly more than I know. Or why don't we just not speed? That's a possibility as well. <laughs> um, Except if you were to hit something... A deer uh, were to jump out in front of you. It'd be great if a deer were to jump out in front of you, and you could pick the speed at which you hit it, given you had no choice but to. But, venison is quite delicious. When I was in driver's ed, they told me if Danny hops in front of my car, he'll buckle down, try and stop, but keep on going straight, don't swerve. Yeah, don't, don't swerve, and, and don't, don't yeah. Okay, this has now turned into a public service announcement. Um, do you guys Ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> You guys think you can tell the difference on a graph between, after a little factoring between a vertical asymptote and a buttonhole discontinuity? Yeah, button is never. And you can find some domain restrictions on these pretty easily as well, right? I would never buttonhole. Do you want to say Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, vertical asymptotes. Okay. The homework tonight is page 354, 2 through 28. 
even. And somebody let two of our missing compadres know that it will be online tonight. Say bye, Mr. Bellavo. Bye, Mr. Bellavo. Bye, Mr. Punjab.